Tibet. I'm going to drop you into a story like a Tarantino Star Wars. Drop you into an episode totally out of order. Early 1990s, my Himalayan trip, India, Nepal, Tibet. I'm dropping into Tibet. One of my weirdest stories. It's going to take some background. So pull up, grab a chair. I won't go into why I was doing this trip. That's, that's a story for an earlier video. I was in Tibet. I'd hitchhiked up to Lhasa, which was a miracle. I was in Lhasa as an independent traveler. I get to Lhasa and I was kind of like, and I had, a, apparently I had a, a month visa, which I shouldn't have had. As an independent traveler back then, it wasn't supposed to be possible. In the back of my mind, I was thinking that I might want to visit this, a holy pilgrimage mountain called Mount Kailash. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Maybe not, Mount Kailash. It's a, it's a pilgrimage site in Tibet. And what it is, it's, uh, it's, it was supposed to be a battle place between the leader of the in original indigenous, uh, like shamanistic religion, which I think was called Bompo. And I think the leader was actually called Bompo and against Milarepa, who had brought Buddhism, I believe from India. And they were having this, this mythical uh, X-Men Avengers battle on this mountain. And there are like, Artif they're supposed to be artifacts of, of the actual battle that happened. So I, I had in the back of my mind, all right, well, one thing I could do when I'm in Tibet, I could go all the way out there. It's way out west. It's like a, I don't know, a one-week ride. And when I say one-week ride, I'm talking like over, there are no roads, and I'm talking over glaciers and uh, deserts and through rivers and just mud. Uh, just And it was expensive. And when I say expensive, any of you who have traveled uh, Asia, especially way back you know that that when when you're talking when you're complaining about prices you know you're complaining about these numbers that you don't understand <laughs> not in the way that you understand here you know so maybe like you thought two hundred dollars for a trip out west you know in a, in a land cruiser supported is, is a lot of money maybe it was 200 maybe it was 400 i don't know like for a round trip you think that's a lot because back then you know i'm staying overnight for 50 cents or a dollar so, you know, that you get all mine hassled into what's expensive or not. Anyway, I was trying to do this on the cheap. So I decided uh, maybe I'll try and hitchhike out there. Because I had heard that you could get onto an expedition. An expedition out west like that, what it's going to be, it's going to be one, two, or three land cruisers supported by a box truck. The box truck will always be coming up the rear. It'll have fuel, a tent, food, you know, things that you need to survive. Uh, out, on, out in the wilderness like that. So I meet this young Canadian, Aaron, 18 years old, alone, hitchhiking through Tibet. What an adventure. He, he's like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And I'm all right. So you know, traveling's like that on the road. You just, you know, you meet people and, you know, you, you do something like that and then you remember them for, for the rest of your life. So somehow, right, with this little uh, Tibetan English dictionary of phrases, I'm going through this truck stop trying to, to find a ride out west. You know, we have as best the papers and permits that we needed. I'd, I'd got them along the way, you know, as best I could. Although what we were doing was supposed to be technically illegal, I heard there were some loopholes. We find a group that has a supported Land Cruiser group. And what it was, it was a group of Germans who had, uh, you know, arranged this trip. And so they were in the Land Cruisers and we negotiated with the box truck drivers who were the owners or the managers of this uh, expedition to go out west. Now, it was a really funny thing because there were two guys, I think, I forget their names. One, one guy was like obviously a driver and dressed semi-indigenously like a driver, very, you know, built like a driver should be you know, out in the wilderness. You're not going to be fancy. But then the other guy was totally fancy. And I, I think his name was Jimmy, but I called him business dude because he wore a damn suit out in the in the wilderness you know the the high plains of tibet just out in the middle of nowhere this guy was wearing a suit for for a couple weeks a few weeks i don't know it was the weirdest thing ever and he was kind of business slimy which you know it fit so anyway we negotiated a price and uh you know what we would do they, and surprisingly to me they agreed to take it all when we got to kailash and i think i, I can't remember now i think i think we had bargained a round trip obviously but we were going to pay them full when we got to Kailash somehow where this story gets interesting and, and what I wanted to say was I can't remember how much it was <laughs> it probably it probably wasn't a lot of it might have been I don't know less than 100 bucks I have no idea I, I forget 501 I'll, I'll look it up 
501 was was the figure. That's the background. A week going out there, you know, we're in the box truck. The Germans are up in the in the Land Cruisers. In, in the box truck is miserable. There's dust. If you're in the box car, it's just miserable. The back is open and there's just dust coming in. You're getting bounced around. It's dark. It smells bad. The, so the back of the truck, we were sharing the space with these Tibetan refugees who, you know, had also hitched a ride, but, but probably for free. And they were going to do uh, the Kailash Kora. So now the reason why people go to Kailash is because they want to, Tibetans are big hikers. They're big hikers. They're big circlers. So they'll circle around things. They're, they're, they're all about wheels, right? So uh, Buddhism is about the wheel, the wheel of life, wheel of, of karma, wheel of dharma. And... Uh, you know, cycles, creation, destruction, reconstruction, resurrection, reincarnation. So they, they like to circle things. So, and they, they have all these legends. So like if you go to Kailash and you circle it, uh, you know, once, you know, it, it's kind of like, I don't know. It, it's probably kind of like saying Hail Mary at, a, at the church when you did your sins Say the Hail Mary this many times, the Our Father this many times. You know, it's kind of absolving you of, of sins. I think I could be wrong on that. I've forgotten a lot of those details. So they would circle it and like there are certain sayings like if you circle it 13 times, you reach this kind of thing. Or if you did it 109 times, you know, you're semi-enlightened. There are all kinds of uh, legends or rules or scriptures about that sort of thing. So for a Tibetan, going to Kailash is kind of like making a holy pilgrimage like Mecca or maybe the Vatican City. I don't know where, where it would be equivalent for us. So I was riding up on the luggage rack on the cab and I, I tied myself up there because it's quite hazardous. You're going over bumps and stuff. You get thrown off or something. And uh, there, was this, <laughs> there was this mummified goat up next to me tied to the rack. At first, it looked like roadkill. But at first, I didn't know what it was. But then as I was up there daily, like little by little, it was disappearing. So I figured... That was a road snack for the drivers. I'd never seen I'd never seen them eating it though. One time, I almost, I definitely almost bit it. We we came, you know, like I said, they're they're not really roads. They're, you know, you could see a couple of trail marks going off in the distance, and we were going on this high plane, and you know, it was a little bit undulating, and the drivers hit one of these undulations a little bit too hard, and when they when they got over it, it was actually more of a false bluff. And that truck came down and bounced around and got on two wheels for a while. And I was up on top, tied to the luggage rack. Yeah, if that thing had turned over, that would have been a bad, that would have been a bad day. The day before we arrived at Kailash. Now, let me just say, we're, we're at high altitude, right? Base, like the flat ground was like 4,000 meters. Hard to breathe. And, you know, of course, you're pushing, like the truck is getting stuck, so you have to push. You're digging sand. You're, you're working hard. You know, because I'm, I'm, I'm a slave, like, in the back, right? The Germans didn't have to do stuff like that. Of course, you know, because they're, they're financing the whole trip. The last day, there, there was this uh, student group that I had seen in Nepal also. And then I'd, I'd seen them in Tibet, and it was a really cool thing. I, don't, I forget what university they were from, but it was some special university program where they study about Asia, Himalayan Asia, and then for like a semester or two, they go traveling around to all these places they studied about. Amazing. And they were doing this badass hike. I mean, you know, in the Himalayas, that was badass. In, in Nepal, that was badass. You know, they're hiking there uh, over um, Thronglaw Pass. Uh, the Annapurna side is where I met them. And then uh, they're going to Kailash. So we'd seen them on the road back and forth, you know, passing them. It was, I forget. It's kind of a big group, maybe 50 kids. We come upon them at a 5,000 meter pass. And just on the other side of the pass, maybe like a half a day's journey is, is the Kailash base camp. And uh, they're stuck, axles deep in mud. As is often the case with some of these high passes, uh, the, <clears throat> the ground is very silty and muddy. And so if it's frozen, it's a piece of cake. So early in the morning, you know, you head over it, you're, you're good to go. If you're like midday when it's been heated up by that, by that sun, you're, you're kind of SOL. And that's what these guys were. <laughs> so we came up to them and sunk to our axles as well. So they're, they're like, I don't know, 15 trucks that are uh, 
axles deep in mud stuck. Now, normally when we would end our day, uh, end our day of driving, um, we would, I think I, yeah, I used to sleep in the truck, <laughs> maybe in a cab uh, is where I was sleeping. I did have a sleeping bag. I don't think I had a sleeping pad for some reason. I think my sleeping pad broke or got lost or something. I didn't have a tent. And uh, so normally I would either sleep in the cab, but before then we would like eat in the Tibetan's tent. The Tibetans had this Tibetan tent, which looks like a yurt kind of, except uh, it's more colorful usually on the outside, a little more simple, obviously, putting it up, taking it down every day. So we'd be in there, but there's this one scary piece of equipment. There was this, the stove. The stove was this, this medieval steampunk kerosene torch. And the kerosene torch would sit either, I think on the ground or in a holder, and then they had an elbow that would direct the flame up to this uh, cooking area. And that's where they, they cooked sampa. Sampa was like some kind of powderized grain or something, it was disgusting. And make tea, yak butter tea and all these things. And, and they'd be laughing and there. So as we would stop each day, we would be partying with these guys without alcohol, of course. So this time, so we're stuck axles deep and we're taking, you know, normally Aaron and I would, would help take the Germans luggage out of the truck because we, wa we wanted to be useful, right? That was one of our goals. We didn't want to get left by the roadside. And, you know, then we were going to do that and go to the Tibet, help set up the Tibetan tent, go to the Tibetan tent. Well, while we were unloading our gear, a business dude had his panties in a bunch and he started like hollering at Aaron saying, we want our money now. We want to get paid now for this ride. The full payment, 500 won, whatever that is. And business dude, business dude's not a big guy. And business dude's kind of getting physical with Aaron. Aaron's not a big guy either. He was, he was thin. And I'm up on the truck with my big ass hiking boots, just thinking, oh man, I could just crush business dude from up here. And I land down next to business dude with, with a thunderous clap, probably down into like superhero pose, like that one knee. <laughs> <laughs> one knee landing. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So, yep, he wants the money now. You know, we that wasn't the agreement. And now I was afraid because we were in a bad spot. You know, up at 5,000 meters, it was really hard to breathe up there. And, you know, it's not like, you know, the, the rule is, you know, climb high, sleep low. You know, you don't want to spend too much time up there. I'm just thinking, you know, we got left up here. It'd be a bad situation. And it's not like there aren't stories like that. We're arguing and he's like, well, if we don't get the money now, you guys can't ride with us and la 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 la. And then all the drivers were like kind of ganging up on us. And then, and then the Germans came and then there was a, this was the day I was dreading because I knew the Germans paid for this whole thing. So I had always wondered what rights the drivers had to like make side hustles where they were getting paid for the resources that the Germans were already paying for, right? So, uh, like subletting, kind of, right? So I, I, I always had feared that, and sure enough, that, that shit hit the fan. So uh, the Germans were angry, you know, and then the drivers are like, well, if these guys don't pay, we're not gonna drive the Germans, and the Germans are like, what the fuck? <laughs> And here we are, 5,000 meters stuck in the mud. I tried to, to reason with uh, this guy, Andy. He was a leader of the, of the student group. He was the guide and he's bilingual. Could speak Tibetan, trilingual, Chinese, Tibetan. I asked him, I said, Andy, you know, is there any chance we could ride with you guys? At least the Kailash, I'll find, we'll, we'll find another ride out of there. I was like, no can do, buddy. I can't do it. I forget why. I was like, oh, damn, so I'm just stuck. So I had no choice. I had to, like, we had to pay these guys 500 won, whatever that was. And I had to swallow, swallow a great big nasty crow. So I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm looking, business dude is right where you are. And, and the driver, I forget his name. And Andy was there and you know, we were just you know, agreeing to pay and like kind of making the rules for going forward. And over business dude's slouching shoulder next to his grumpy face, I could see the Tibetans, you know, setting up the Tibetan tent and, it's all set up, they're in there getting warm, probably making their, their crappy tzampa. And I'm looking at business dude's sour face and then I hear this explosion. And I look at the Tibetan tent explode into flames 
And then I see, like, I don't know, four flaming human beings come running out of the damn tent. And all of us kind of spring into action at the same time, me and, and Aaron and Andy and even business dude. And we run over, you know, we're, we're grabbing people. So I grab someone, someone's come by me, I grab them and throw them down into the snow and put snow on his face. A lot of faces were on fire. And uh, I, I can't remember, four people, something like that, were, were pretty bad. And, and then they were putting out the flames. You know, the flames didn't take too much to go out because we're at high altitude. And, the, and what had happened was, yeah, so that, that damn kerosene torch lamp from hell like blew up and just spit burning kerosene all over everybody. And then when we went to the tent, like the tent on fire and we put it out, but the, the, the kerosene torch was like like a rocket shooting all around. Someone, someone killed it somehow. I don't remember how. So these poor bastards. So luckily the students had a very nice first aid tent and they, you know, bandaged them all up. You know, a couple of them had like, I don't know, 20% of their faces burnt, 20, 25. And the one guy had his eye burnt pretty bad. But these Tibetans were tough. One guy was really bad, and he got sent off to a hospital. The hospital was like a week, a week away. And then, uh, but the other, the other few who were burnt, they, they still did that lap around Kailash, which for me was two or three days. Like for normal humans, it's like two or three days, and Tibetans usually do it in 24 hours, like one 24-hour burn because they're tough tough as and that's what these guys did so that night i wasn't allowed to sleep in the tent uh, sorry i wasn't i didn't have a tent to sleep in because it was burnt and for some reason i was i was kicked out of sleeping in the truck probably because reasons and so i i slept on the ground on only just a plastic sheet in the mess tent of the students and i had the coldest night of sleep in my life i don't think i slept it was 5,000 meters. I don't know how cold it was. I didn't have a thing under me. I put all my clothes under me, under the sleeping bag to try and have as a pad. And I nearly froze to death that night. But the next day we made it to Kailash and that's another story. Thanks for listening. See you on down the road. I wanted to come back and address one thing about that last video that I didn't feel comfortable. When I was describing the scene about the people on fire coming running out of the tent, I, I was kind of chuckling as I said it. and. The reason is, still to this day, I, I have a real hard time reconciling why I wasn't in that tent. Uh, just, you know, I don't have any beliefs of higher powers or fate or someone looking out for me. It's a nice thing to think about, but I don't have any strong belief in that. So it's just crazy coincidence that an a-hole like business dude kept me from, from having my, my face all burnt up. So uh, that was why I was, yeah, it, it was kind of an emotional thing and it was kind of a disbelief. And I guess you never know, <laughs> you never know, you know, it's kind of a Buddhist saying, you know, something, something happens, it seems bad, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, you know, who knows, let's see how it plays out. Oh, something happens, it seems good. Well, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. Let's see how it plays out. So that's what I wanted to come back and explain. Thanks for listening. See you on down the road.